I'm Laura McFarlane. I want to thank you for stopping by Cross My Heart Ministry. If you're here looking for our weekly teaching video that we always typically post on Friday, I want to let you know that we've had some weather challenges here in Northwest Arkansas. So we canceled Bible study two weeks ago, then we met, then we had to cancel again. Hopefully the winter weather is all out of the way here, but it's gotten us just a little bit jumbled. The lesson that was supposed to be next was going to be a combination of lessons four and five. That would combine the lessons in our Joy of Living study book that deal with being lost. There were two lessons put together, one on uh, the lost sheep and then one on the lost coin and the lost son or the prodigal son. And so because we had to cancel the first time, we combined those two lessons. So the next time our group is able to meet, I have a teaching lecture already and we will go through a combination of those two lessons. Now, this week we also canceled class and we were supposed to do that, but I'm gonna hopscotch over and in order for us to stay on track, the next lesson would be lesson six. We're going to skip lesson six and then after I finish lessons four and five, I know this is confusing, we'll jump on to lesson seven. But lesson six is so valuable, I hated to just not cover it at all. Many of you are doing our Joy of Living study and if you would like to get a copy of this book, you can email me directly. But we do have friends all over the country or women that I've met as I've taught at women's retreats or events who have picked up a copy of this and are studying on their own. Even women who can't attend a regular study and just do it on their own because they work or what have you. So for the benefit of all of us, I'm going to just share a few thoughts today on lesson six. This is the, the parable about the rich man and Lazarus from Luke chapter 16. So let's just get right to it. I don't have a PowerPoint prepared. I'm just going to share some thoughts from my study and research as I began to prepare to, to do the teaching and reading the different commentaries and making some notes. So I'm just going to share some thoughts. I think the first pass through we see some things, but as we study and we dig deeper, there just always seems to be more. That's how scripture works. There's always a deeper truth. It just seems like we dig up nuggets of gold as we go through the layers, as we read and study it together. Well, it's always our custom to read the word of God aloud when we meet on Wednesdays together as a large group. So I'm just going to do that now. So you can either get your Bible and read along with me from Luke chapter 16, or you can just listen as I read these words so that we kind of get our hearts and minds focused on this parable that our Lord Jesus left recorded for us in scripture. And he says this, it's Luke 16 verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Well, right there from the very get-go, we see a huge study in contrast. We see this very wealthy and well-to-do man. We don't even have a name for him, but we know that he is enjoying his wealth. He is living in luxury, and he's doing it every single day. Contrast that to Lazarus, who does hasn't have a name. And we, we learn a lot about Lazarus in just a, sh a few short words. It says that he was laid. He was at his gate, and he had been laid there. So that probably tells us that he was somehow crippled and unable to walk, that people had to bring him there where he could beg for food. It says he was indeed a beggar and he's covered with sores and longing to eat. So he, he's hungry and he's sick. And it says that even, even the dogs would come and lick his sores. So we just see such a contrast of luxury to being poor and, and, and living the high life versus being hungry and being able to go to and fro versus being dependent upon others to take you there. A contrast between these two men. And then as the story unfolds, we see another contrast, a contrast between heaven and hell. And that's really probably the, the main story of this whole lesson is that it is indeed a lesson about heaven and hell. So let's see what happens with the rest of the story, the parable that Jesus told. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the finger, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue 
because I am in agony in this fire. You see, it's, it's a sobering, uh, terrifying view of hell that we see here. In fact, this may be the most sobering picture of hell in the entire Bible. When we read this parable and, and how Jesus used this story to describe hell to his listeners then and, and of course for all of us since it's recorded in scripture for all time. Hell is a place of torment and misery. It is horrific uh, and it is final. It, it's a scary place, but it is a real place. Hell is a place of punishment. It is a place of finality. Warren Wiersbe has said that hell is not a hospital uh, for the sick. Hell is a prison for the condemned. So we're going to see as the story unfolds the finality of hell because the, the, Lazarus makes this request. He requests just a drink of water, just just something to cool. Send, send Lazarus to me, please, Abraham, he says. Just the tip of his finger. Just give me a little bit of relief. And so we see here, Jesus makes the point, hell is a literal place. It really does exist. And the, 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 when we die, we don't just cease to exist. We, there is a hell and there is a heaven. And I think there are many people who don't believe in God who would scoff at this, who would choose to say, well, I don't believe that there's a hell. Well, whether we believe it or not doesn't mean that that's true. Clearly, our Lord Jesus, the truth of God's holy word tells us there is a literal hell and it's a place of finality and there are no second chances. The people in hell today wish, would love for our death on this earth to be just the end, to cease to exist. But that is not what happens. The people that are condemned to hell will suffer greatly and they will suffer for eternity. Abraham replied, but Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here, from there to us. There's the finality truth. That, that's the place of finality. It's permanent. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This, this parable is a call for us to have a sobering look at heaven and hell and eternal destiny. We, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, know there is a heaven. We know there is a hell. But if we really and truly believe that, then how can we not share the gospel with those who need to know him? C.S. Lewis said, It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. My heart is just pierced as I read those words. Have I become ineffective in this world? Am I so comfortable hanging out with fellow believers who believe what I believe and who I'm going to share eternity with that I have ceased to be effective, ceased to be concerned about my lost neighbors or my lost family members or lost friends that need to hear the gospel. And telling them once maybe isn't enough, we must continue to press in and pray and ask the Lord to, to release those opportunities. When we read this passage and we see the destiny of the rich man in this story, it should be sobering and serious and, and prompt us to have those hard conversations. I think perhaps we are embarrassed to talk about a hell. Is that true? Is that true in your small group or Sunday school class or in your church? Does it sort of mess with our concept or certainly with the culture's concept that if I'm going to make time to go to church or, or mess with religion or, or anything that has to, to do with a topic like that or talk about God, shouldn't I feel better? Shouldn't it make me feel better and not worse and, and certainly not bad about myself? Uh, and, and I think we get lulled into thinking that, that it should be sort of a warm fuzzy and that talking about God should make everyone happy. But this is the sobering reality, that hell is, a, it, 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 there's a place of finality that is heaven 
or it is hell? And can we truly lead someone to Christ and lead them to know Jesus as their Savior unless they first acknowledge they need a Savior. They have to acknowledge their sin, and they have to know that hell is a literal place. So we can't truly embrace and appreciate the love of God even without acknowledging our own depravity and appreciating how much Jesus sacrificed, how much he took on in paying the penalty for our sin. This parable, this truth from our Lord Jesus Christ should prompt every believer to embrace their serious responsibility to share the gospel with their lost friends and family. I want to challenge you to begin to pray even now, Lord, who is it in my life that needs to know you? Who is it that I need to pray for openings to have those gospel, God-centered conversations? This rich man ended up in a place that he never, ever expected to be. We see him described as being wealthy, um, and, and it's not sinful to be wealthy. Scripture say, doesn't say that money is evil. It says money is the root of all evil. Because what happens with money is sometimes people get so greedy and, and distracted by it, and it becomes this compulsion to have more and more and to hold on to it. Money can be a great gift. It can be a great resource if it's handled responsibly. It, it, the scripture says that um, to whom much is given, much is required. Money can be a great blessing to be used to bless others. And perhaps there's no greater blessing than to use what God has given us to release blessing to others. But this man in this parable is so consumed with self and promoting himself and enjoying all that he has gathered that he ignored the needs of others in his world. He had to literally step around Lazarus as he was going to and fro. He was oblivious. He had no concern whatsoever for this man before him. It, it doesn't tell us that he was evil or intentionally cruel. He was just oblivious and unconcerned. He was insensitive and uncaring. And, and so that was, that was the, the status of his life was quickly over. He ends up in hell. Um, and then we, we contrast that to Lazarus, this man who was sick and crippled and ignored. So right there on the doorstep. And then the quick role reversal as they get to heaven. One big takeaway from this, of course, is the call for us to share the gospel. I think the second, another big takeaway, comes from Abraham's exchange with this rich man at the very end of the parable where the rich man finally does show some concern for others. He begs Abraham, send Lazarus to my five brothers. And, and, and he is concerned for his brothers. He doesn't want them to end up where he is. He wants them to know. And so he begs, begs Abraham, send Lazarus to them. And seeing someone come back from the dead, he thinks that spectacle, that miracle will call them to repentance. And Abraham says, no, no, they have... They have Moses and the prophets, he says. And of course, Moses and the prophets, that, that points to the Old Testament scriptures. And, and the rich man protests, no, no, he said. If someone from the dead goes to him, then they're going to repent. Do we buy into the lie that there has to be some spectacle? There's got to be a miracle or there, there's got to be great music. There's got to be something, bells and whistles and, and something fabulous. So scripture is sufficient. I think that's another takeaway truth from here. Jesus said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. They're not going to believe a big, powerful event if they don't believe the truth of scripture. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you as I wrap up here. First Peter 1.23 says, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. It is the word of God that brings salvation. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. People have to hear the truth. They have to hear the gospel, hear about Jesus Christ and be given an opportunity to respond. And then finally, Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I want to ask you, I don't want to ask myself, are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we embarrassed to share the gospel? Do we firmly believe in hell as much as we believe in heaven? And do we really want that on us? It is part of our job, the reason that Jesus has left us on this planet, even 
having our own salvation? Are we so selfish knowing that our destiny is secure that we would hold on to that truth for ourselves? If, if we had a tree in our backyard that somehow had a fruit that would cure cancer, would we be so selfish as to hold on to that, that wonderful medical fruit for ourselves and not share it with those who are, who are dying? Well, of course not. We would want to get the word out. We would share it with everyone. So my friends, I ask you, if, if the stakes are so much higher and it's not just physical life that could be saved, but it's eternal life, what are we waiting for? Why are we embarrassed? Are we ashamed? We, we need not be ashamed. We have the truth on our side. We have the power of scripture. We need to make sure that those that we love and those that we know hear the word of God and have an opportunity to respond with believing faith. If we share and they reject it, that's on them. But if we refuse to share and we hold that truth inside of us, then that's on us. We need to take our responsibility to share the gospel very seriously. Would you begin joining with me to pray now that we would be women of faith who intentionally and prayerfully ask the Lord, who do you want me to be begin praying for God? And would you create opportunities for those gospel-centered conversations? And when the door is open, would you give me courage to walk through it? Would you pitch your words on my tongue, your love in my heart, your thoughts in my mind, so that as I engage with this person that I know that needs to know Jesus, God, would you go with me? Would, would we do it together? I want to ask you, who would you step out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with if you knew you couldn't fail because you and Jesus are doing it together? Thanks for listening today. Thanks for listening into this little bit of devotion and thoughts from Luke chapter 16. I hope you'll come back next time when we kind of go backwards a little bit to look at the previous lesson in Luke chapter 15 where we'll be talking about all those three parables about lost. The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. So we'll have that for you with our next teaching, but until then, keep studying the Word of God, keep reading, keep praying, keep pressing in, and don't forget to be asking the Lord, who do you want me to share the gospel with? I'm Laurie McFarland. This is Cross My Heart Ministry. Thank you for being a loyal listener. Thank you for being a subscriber. And if you're not yet, it's easy. Click the big red subscribe button, enter your Gmail address, and you'll get a notification every time we post a new video. Have a great week and blessings upon you, my friend, as you go forth to powerfully and prayerfully share the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ.